That was quite a crew. We might need a new church. We might need a new church. Amen. Wow. Hey, we already had family time. Hello. Good Lord. Hey, it is good to be back in the house of the Lord. Amen. It is good to be back in the house of the Lord. As I look around at those of you that are here and that I know of that have personally been sick during this time. And you know what? We're overcomers. Hey, hey. We have overcome. We have persevered. And you know what I want to talk about today? Victory over disease. Victory over disease. Uh, so many of us have been sick over the last number of weeks, and I mean sick. I was, I'm, I'm one of them. Tammy is one of them. We've been sick. I've, I've talked to many folks, and, and this thing has affected each one differently. I quit chewing Copenhagen. In 1991, have not had a chew of Copenhagen since that day. And when I quit chewing, I lost all my heartburn. Ha <laughs> ha, go figure. Don't take a rocket scientist to figure that out, does it? But since I've been sick, I get heartburn all the time now. And for no reason. I've talked to many people that have had the same situation. I don't know why. I don't know what that is all about. But I know one thing. I'm healed in Jesus' name. And I want to spend a few moments. Actually, it's going to be more than a few. I've got to figure out if I can still preach. See how this goes. I did uh, was honored to uh, be able to... Uh, officiate Tom's dad's memorial service yesterday and uh, fell up the stairs <laughs> that was a good time after that I was in Azalea and uh, officiated at a wedding today I'm here and I'm going to share what I believe God's message is for you and I today because if you listen to the media, if you listen to the media, we're all going to die. But I have found a love that is stronger than life or death at any day. And I want to talk to you this morning about victory over disease because whether we realize it or, law, or not, uh, a lot of life's battles nick us at the edges. If you want to ruin a good knife, cut something other than what it was designed to cut. You get nicks. In your, in your, in, on the edge of, of that blade on that knife and it will change that knife. Nicks on the edge. Not strong enough to kill you. Not strong enough to kill you, but they pester and they provoke you. They wear us down. They, it uses up our money. It saps our vigor. It clouds our joy. What is the joy of the Lord? Somebody said it. It's our strength. 
The joy of the Lord is my strength. Well, today I want to look at two stories that show us that the battle of this life will not stop us if only we will persevere. You're here today because you made a decision somewhere along the line that I'm not giving in to sickness or any other disease. I'm going forward. Amen? That's why we're here today. We made that decision. Turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark. Turn to the fifth chapter. I might need to run, I don't know. Mark chapter 5, drop down to verse 21 and we'll read through the end of the chapter. There's two stories in here. There's a story in the story. If you go to the, to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, if you read the, the, uh, the beginning part of this chapter, which we're not going to, but there's another situation that where Jesus has crossed the sea, he, he lands over by the, the place of the Gadarenes, and he is confronted by a demon-possessed man. This guy is so screwed up, he's so messed up, by the demonic realm that they've actually tried to contain him with chains and locks and 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 nothing has worked everything that he is they've tried to bind him up with he's broken free he's out of his mind he is naked he's just a mess Jesus comes along declares some things the spirits come out of him go into a herd of swine run off the cliff and into the sea the pig farmer wasn't yelling yay (laughs) amen the pig farmer didn't see the pig farmer didn't see the spiritual value in what had just taken place all he could see was the monetary value of all of his hogs going into the sea But that man, from whom all the demonic force came out of, was set free. The people of the town said, "Uh, Jesus, leave. Leave. You're freaking us out. That's what they were saying without saying it. That's kind of how we feel when somebody stands up and says, Pastor, I got something to say. And they share about looking into the throne room, looking into the eyes of Jesus, looking at him and, and taking and casting our... I'm, that, 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 oh, man, that freaks me out. No, nope, that's reality. That's spiritual reality. Jesus goes from that environment, gets back in the boat, goes back to Capernaum. And this is what happens. Now when Jesus had crossed over again, if you want, you can stand today for the reading of God's Word. I think it's something of an honor that we stand when God's Word is read. It's not a ritualistic thing. It's just saying, God, I recognize this is your Word. And we stand in your presence as this word is read. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him. And he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So when Jesus met with him, a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for twelve years, and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had, and was no better, but rather grew worse. 
when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see a multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. And while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house and said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further and as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken he said to the ruler of the synagogue do not be afraid only believe and he per permitted no one to follow him except Peter James and John the brother of James and w then when he, when he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw the tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly when he came and he said to them why make this commotion and weep the child is not dead but sleeping and they ridiculed him but when he had put them all outside he took the father and the mother of the child those who were with him and entered the house of the child and, and where the child was lying he took the child by the hand and said to her uh, Talitha Kumi which is translated little girl I say to you arise and immediately the girl arose and walked for she was 12 years of age and they were overcome with great amazement but he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and said that something should be given her to eat father I pray as we stand in your presence today God you would open your our eyes to, of understanding open our spirits oh God to to the interpretation the preaching of your word Lord that your Holy Spirit would fill us with exactly what you have for us out of this message and out of your word today I pray in Jesus name and everybody said amen and amen man I don't know uh, I don't know if you grasped everything that was being said and I'm sure you didn't because I'm sure I didn't uh, of what is going on in these two stories in in this passage of scripture one crowd sighs with relief as they see Jesus leave right that's the the that's on 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 the, the demoniac side of, of of the of the lake one crowd sighs with relief as they see Jesus leave but another crowd is waiting to welcome him when he returns home to Capernaum in the latter crowd there are two people who were specifically or especially especially anxious to see him Jairus a man with a dying daughter and an anonymous woman suffering from an incurable disease see it was Jairus who approaches Jesus first but it was the woman who was first helped and so we will begin with her I want us to look at this at what I mean there are so many things in this story that that is going on and I I'm gonna miss some of them but I hope I can uh, 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 stir you enough until you get into it and and begin to look for yourself let me remind you that Jesus responds by faith the Bible says that without faith it is impossible to please God if there are areas of your life and you look at a situation and you say of yourself I can handle this I can take care of this myself I you know I you're 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 in kind of a I mean and though there are those things and that, that we do that but there are things we're building a church building out there how many of you know that 
Amen. We're building a church. We're actively behind the scenes building a church right out there. There are processes and, and things that take place before the dirt ever gets stirred up. We are actively in the process of building a church right out there. God is actively in the process of building His church right in here. God is actively building His church inside of every one of you and I. The Bible says that this body is a tent. The tabernacle of dwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. Look at this. Whether our prayers are are midget or giant size, Jesus pays attention to faith. He wants to build your faith. He wants to affirm your faith. Always he wants that. He loves faith. We need to stop trying to measure our faith and start using our faith. Quit trying to measure your faith and begin to use your faith. There are bodybuilders and, and, and they do all this stuff. I mean, they pump the iron. They get buffed up. They're measuring their muscles and, and, and all that. <laughs> Woo! I've had, ba- I've had muscle-bound guys when I was younger in school that would pump weights. And, man, I mean, they, they were ripped. They had, the, you know, all the muscles and everything. And I thought, well, those are the guys that I need to go cut firewood with me. Because, I mean, they're ripped. These guys are stout. They couldn't pick up any more than I could. You know why? Because they had worked on a certain set of muscles in your body. And when you're doing this all the time, this ain't getting anything. Now, if I'd have rolled them guys over on their back, flat on the ground, rolled a chunk of wood, they could have thrown it in a pickup. Because those are the muscles that they developed. Those are the muscles that they strengthened. But, but to reach down and pick up a big chunk of Madrone or Doug Fur, they didn't have that set of muscles built up. So God wants to, He wants us to quit looking in the mirror. You ever been in a gym where they pump a lot of weight? Mirrors everywhere. Get over yourself. You know what I mean? I mean, they want to look at how good they look. The veins are popping out everywhere. It'd be a picture of me and the thing would be fall down around my neck. I'd be scared. <laughs> You'd be like, oh, look at that guy. Quit measuring your faith and start using it. As a synagogue ruler... Jairus, however you say his name, I've said it three different ways and I don't think any of them are right. But we know who we're talking about. He's a ruler of the synagogue. He held a high position in high esteem in the town. And a lot of the synagogue rulers had close ties to the Pharisees. So the reality is it is very likely that some synagogue rulers had been pressured not to support Jesus. Don't support this guy. Don't get involved with this guy. He's bad news. Do not support him. But neither position, listen to me. Neither position nor pressure would stop Jairus from coming to the one man he knew could help his very sick daughter. There was something about the life of Jesus that Jairus said, look, I don't care anymore about the synagogue. I don't care all that much about the Pharisees. I know one thing, my baby's sick, and I know one guy that can take care of her, and I'm going to see him. For him to fall at Jesus' feet and to plead for Jesus to come and to heal his daughter was a significant and a daring act of respect and worship. But don't forget this, Jairus' daughter was dying. When your daughter's dying, when your son is dying, all, all holds are, are barred. Now, I mean, we're, we're, whatever it takes... 
See, we don't know the nature of her sickness. We don't know why she was sick, how she was sick. Apparently nothing had helped her, and she was soon going to die. That's the report. My brother-in-law was just yesterday. Many of you have been praying for, for him. My wife has been upset. She's lost her mom, her dad, three uncles, an aunt, her sister. She's lost everybody on her side of the family except this one brother, and he was in the hospital on a, on a ventilator. And she was upset. And I said, man, all we can do is believe. Pray and believe. You were praying and believing with us. Yesterday, he was taken off the ventilator. He's got just a, you know, a... a probably an oxygen thing on his nose or whatever but I'm telling you it's because at some point you have to say I'm not moving from this place I'm standing by faith I, I'm not moving from this place he remembered somebody that could help he remembered someone whose touch had healed many people in Capernaum because listen let me tell you something what happened around there with Jesus everybody knew about it whether they were whether they were Pharisees or Sadducees or or whatever they knew because the word was getting out and so here we are pushing through the crowd he makes his way to Jesus this is a man on a mission When your child's sick, there ain't nobody better get in your way. Nobody. Because I will run over you. Jairus, same way. She's sick. He pushes through the crowd. He's on a mission. Nothing is going to stop the father's this father's love his request was simple yet it was filled with faith his request was simple he asked Jesus for Jesus's touch on his daughter he knows that if Jesus were to come his daughter would be healed and she would live that was the only thought in his mind if I can just get Jesus to my house my baby's gonna be all right how many of you know that if Jesus comes to your house, everybody's going to be all right? How many of you know uh, that Jesus is in you? And so Jesus is at your house. Got, got a little quieter. Sometimes we just have to just well up with Jesus on the inside, lay hands on ourselves, and say, hey, in Jesus' name, I'm healed. Just saying. His request was simple, but it was full of faith. He asked for Jesus' touch on his daughter, knowing that if Jesus were to come, his daughter would be healed and she would live. Jesus apparently had heard the urgency in Jairus' voice. He saw the strain of worry on his face. And so filled with compassion, Jesus goes with him. So Jesus, Jairus, the disciples and a large crowd begin to make their way to Jairus' house. Many people thronged through the streets. So many of them were there that they pressed around Jesus. Can, can you imagine what's going on? I mean, it's like walking through the fair. People bumping into you. Amen. People knocking into you. There were so many people that the streets, in the streets, they were pressed around Jesus. Then right in the middle of the story is a story in a story. Right in the middle of this story, there's a story. In the crowd that pressed on Jesus, there's another person, and she too is in need of divine help. And she's already made up her mind. She has already made up her mind we read about it earlier 
This woman had known so, uh, had, had known many demoralizing days, and yet she came. Now let me just stop for a second, because the reality is, for her to even be outside of her home was such an act of faith. Because according to the law, she was unclean. Because the Bible said that any woman with a discharge of blood was unclean, had to be set aside for seven days. Anybody that touched her had to be uh, washed and all these things until, until night. I mean, it was a mess. So for her to say, look, I'm done with this. I've heard of a love that is stronger than life itself. And I'm going outside in the sunlight. I'm going out amongst the people. And I know if I could just touch his clothes. That's what she said. I read it to you. What a move. Despite years of weakness, she had not given up hope. Believing Jesus could help, she left her sickbed. She joined the crowd, and she found her answer. Mm. She found her answer. She reached out in faith, and she was healed. We must never cave into the persisting problems. No problem need keep us from God. He is always ready to help. He's always ready to help. Personally, coming to Jesus is a real secret, is the real secret, rather, of peace and healing. We have to connect with Him. We've got to make a connection with the Lord. You know when I tend to not measure up the most? It's always at a time when I have let my time with the Lord slide. We've just had, what, four or five Sundays off? I don't know about the rest of you, but how hard was it to set aside a time and say, you know what, I'm not being able to get together with the family, but I'm going to have time with Jesus. Things pop up. Things just happen. We got this to do, that to do, something else to do. And all of a sudden, I've gone a whole week, haven't even said hi to Jesus. Amen? We have to always keep our relationship with Jesus fresh and alive or we will not, or we will rather, find ourselves getting kicked around by the world. By the world, the nature of this lady's illness caused all this additional suffering. The bleeding caused the woman to be in constant condition of ritual uncleanness. She couldn't worship in the synagogue. She couldn't have normal social relationships. And anybody that came in contact with her would also become unclean. So this woman was treated basically just like a leper but something of greatness don't miss this something of greatness happened in the life of this lady you know where it started it started back in her house when by faith she said hey I'm, I'm coming I, bam she kicked that door out. Bam, I'm coming out. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a woman on a mission. You do, you do just listen, men. Don't get in the way of a woman on a mission. This woman was on a mission. She had, listen, for 12 years, She's been stuck in this house. For 12 years, Jairus had a daughter. I don't know what the significance was between uh, uh, of, of 12, but she was suffering for 12 years. Jairus' daughter was 12 years old. 
She's sick and tired of being sick and tired. In a real sense, she got, again, sick and tired of being sick and tired. All mustered up, muddled up with all the, all the faith she had. She, she built it all up. And in the spirit, she gathered herself and she went out and she got her healing. And Jesus meets all of us on the road where weak faith, desperate and worried, becomes trusting and confident where midgets grow into giants. David was way littler than Goliath. But we all know how that deal ended. See, the Greek word for suffered in this verse is the same uh, as in, in verse 25 above. This woman had suffered in pain even while under the care of many, many doctors. She had become destitute in trying to get a cure, having spent all she had on treatment. Mark adds this detail. Matthew leaves it out. And Mark puts it in here to show us that human endeavor had availed her nothing. She only continued to get worse. If you're struggling with something, if there are things in your life and they just keep staying the same or getting worse, you might have to think about doing something different. What's the definition of insanity? To do the same thing over and over and expect a different result. Ain't gonna happen. It is not gonna happen. I see it on Facebook. People wonder why I'm on Facebook, because I study people. That's pretty much why I'm on there. I learned so much about you. And can I just tell you, there are people that are a part of this church that are completely different on Facebook. Completely 180 out on Facebook. Trouble, 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 trouble. And they give voice to that. How many of you know that the things that you give voice to are the things that are coming on you? The Bible says in Proverbs, the power of life and death are in your tongue. You keep talking about how bad your life is, I got news for you. It's going to get bad. When you, I, I'm not talking about name it and claim it and blab it and grab it and all that kind of stuff. I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about speaking life to yourself. I am an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of, of, of my testimony. I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Devil, you ain't got enough power to... You know what I'm, talking, you know what I'm saying? I get a little fed up sometimes at, with me. I'm only telling you this because it's what I need. Don't be so quiet. I need encouragement here today. She, I'm telling you, she became destitute in trying to get a cure, having spent all that she had on treatment. She only continued to get worse. There was no hope for alleviating her suffering until she heard about Jesus. When Jesus shows up, all bets are off. In the crowd that met Jesus on the shore that day, two people had came to seek him out. Jairus in need of healing for his dying daughter. This unnamed woman in need of healing for her own incurable, incurable disease. Both came by faith, knowing that Jesus could take care of their particular problem. Jairus had already petitioned Jesus, and Jesus was on the way. 
this woman heard about Jesus' miracle working power and had come to Capernaum to find him. And on the day of his return, she works her way through the crowd. She comes up behind Jesus. She knew that the only had to touch his clothes and she, and she would be healed. And God changed the situation that had been a problem for 12 years. She touches him. For 12 years, she had been one of the unclean and had not been able to lead any kind of a normal life. Jesus changed that and restored her. You know what I love the most about this story? I love that she got healed. But I love the lesson that Jesus teaches the disciples in the story in the story. Because I've mentioned it six or seven times that the crowd thronged around Jesus. They were bumping into one another. He was fighting his way through the crowd. There were, there were thousands of people there, and they were, he was working his way through the crowd, bumping in. You know what I'm talking about? Like, kind of like going to Walmart on Black Friday, somebody said. <laughs> The disciples ask Jesus a profound question. Jesus says, who touched me? The disciples are like, hello. Everybody here touched you. You've been bouncing your way like a BB in a box car all the way through here trying to get that people are knocking and you want to know who touched you and Jesus said yes I want to know who touched me because there's a difference between bumping into somebody on accident or just trying to fight your way through the crowd and it's an entirely different thing when you reach out by faith and touch Jesus and virtues flowed from Jesus, the Bible said, and she got healed that day. Not only did she get healed, but she got restored. She became whole, physically and spiritually. You know how I know? Because Jesus now calls her daughter. Part of the family. She's not only healed in her physical ailment, she's healed in the spiritual realm. And she is now part of the kingdom of Almighty God. She knew she only had to touch him and she'd be healed. And God changed that situation. And like the leper and the demon-possessed man, this chronically ill woman was considered unclean for 12 years. Unclean. Jesus changes it, restores it. Sometimes, church, we're tempted to give up on people or situations that have not changed for many years. Let me tell you something. Don't give up. Don't quit praying and don't quit believing. Don't quit reaching out and getting a hold of the hem of His garment. Keep praying. God can change what seems unchangeable giving new purpose and giving hope keep praying my wife was certain because we've all heard you know what the, the the statistic is the statistic is that when you get put on a ventilator the mortality rate is 89 percent that's bad one of, my, one of my staff pastors from when I was in Utah, I just put this on the prayer chain last night. I would encourage you to pray. He's got a granddaughter that for five weeks has been on a ventilator. He reached out to me yesterday and said, Hey, will you pray? Will you put her on your prayer line? Yes, I will. You know why? Because God can change what seems unchangeable. Keep praying. In verse 34, there are some words, three words, and these words are they. Go in peace. Go in peace. Can I tell you, 
the words go in peace are more literally translated go into peace now listen it's one thing to say Bob go in peace in other words just leave here but be happy while you're going but what he is saying is go into peace why is there a difference the difference is this the difference is you're in turmoil you've been in turmoil for 12 years you've been in turmoil but I just healed you ha <laughs> ha I just set you free I just made you whole you're now part of the family walk away from this turmoil and go into peace shalom nothing broken nothing missing shalom there's one more but I can't remember Go into peace with this healing that Jesus gave this woman in her life. He opened the door and held it for her. Jesus wishes her peace of both body and of soul, renewed health for a body and eternal salvation for her soul. It all came in a package deal. And with the words, be freed from your suffering, this woman knew that her cure was permanent. In verse 35, when Jairus heard the news from home, it must have cut to his heart. Your daughter is dead. There's no worse words that a parent can hear other than, than your child has died. Man, I'll tell you, as a parent, we don't want to hear that. Parents are never supposed to outlive their children he heard those words your daughter is dead he knew that Jesus could heal but now we've been issued this other decree we've been we, we I mean it's one thing for her to be sick she's now dead she's dead it seemed to be the end of hope for him. Yes, Jesus ignored the unbelief of those around him. And he said this, don't be afraid, just believe. How are you going to respond when you hear those words? Your spouse has died. Your child has died. I'll tell you what Jesus is saying only believe only believe see when you feel hopeless and afraid when others claim that nothing can be done remember that Jesus is in fact the source of all hope and promise he's our source you may have to disregard the unbelief of others and hold firmly to Jesus not everybody got to go in the house when Jesus raised that girl from the dead you know why because he would not allow unbelief to be in the room he shows up what's the first thing he sees all the mourners they're paid mourners these are professional mourners they can moan and wail with the best of them It's true. They hired them. You get a couple people bawling and squalling, and before long, everybody's bawling and squalling. How many of you know that's true? It's the same way with laughing. You start laughing, and next thing you know, everybody's laughing. It's just the way it is. It's human nature. So they hire all these mourners, and they come, and they're bawling and squalling. Oh, she's dead. Oh, God, she's dead dad walks up she must be dead because the mourners are here I mean that's just the reality of the whole deal she has got to be dead because the mourners are here not only our family that's upset we they've already went out and hired the ballers and the squalors. 
so she must be dead. All the time, Jesus is like, don't pay attention to what's going on around here. Don't, be atten- don't, don't pay attention to what your eyes can see. Remember what I told you? He did not let unbelief go in the room. He didn't even let all of his disciples go in the room. I mean, if we're going to get nasty, we just will get nasty. Ask yourself this question. And I'm, I said, you ask. I ain't asking. I'm just presenting it. But would he let you in? Would he been? No, stay at the door. Come on in. Where would you fit? When you come to pray for me, hello. When you come to pray for me, don't come in, lay hands on me, pour oil all over me, pray, oh God, heal him, and then walk out and go, he's going to die. Don't do that. If that's your attitude, don't even come. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just saying, listen, if we can't, we, we, if you're going to come and pray, Mike, oh, God, Mike, be healed, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you better believe that Mike is going to get healed. Because that's what healed the woman, and that's what healed the daughter, was faith that no matter what it looks like, she's dead. He goes in there and tells her, hey, get up. And while you're at it, get her something to eat. So she didn't just come back to life. She was restored to health. Give her some food. Nourish her physical body. You may have to disregard the unbelief of others and hold firmly to Jesus. No doubt all of his... All, all of his being responded with con- convulsive sorrow when he heard that his, his beloved daughter was dead. I'm, I imagine it tore his heart out. But Jesus said, and this is the literal translation, Jesus said, Be not afraid, go on believing. Before he heard the news, it was only believe. But now the news has really got bad. Jesus says, hey, go on believing. The way you believed before, just keep believing. Forget about the report. Whose report are you going to believe? The Bible says I'm healed and I'm set free. Whose report are you going to believe? Don't be afraid. Go on believing. In other words, you had a certain amount of faith when you came to me and your faith was helped when you saw what I did for that woman. Now don't quit. Keep on believing. Some of us have walked through the valley of COVID. Some of your family may be in the valley of COVID right now. Don't be afraid. Go on believing. When you first heard they were sick, you prayed. Don't quit praying. Go on believing. Keep seeking Jesus. Don't quit. Keep believing. Maybe today you're here and you don't don't know how to even start with this believing. Well, I can tell you it starts with Jesus. It starts with what he did at the cross. It starts with what he did before the cross where he was beaten 
where he was mocked and ridiculed and all those things. Yet he looked down through the corridors of time and he saw you and he saw me. And he hung on that cross with a love greater than life itself. Jesus did not hold his life in higher esteem than your life. He gave his life that whosoever would believe on him would not perish but would have everlasting life. And there is a life with heads bowed and eyes closed, people praying. There is a love greater than all of your sin. I know that because He saved me. There's new faces in here today. There are people that, that, that I really know nothing about. But I can assure you that there is a man named Jesus and he knows everything about you. He knows every shortcoming. He knows every time you've succeeded, every time you've failed, every time you've said, I'm not ever doing that again, and you did it again. See, it gets down to this. He said in his word, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. Well, preacher, what about all my sin? Your sin is washed away by the blood of the Lamb. The Bible said that Jesus said, I will cast your sin as far as the east is from the west, and I will remember it no more forever. Yeah, but when I sinned, I was already saved. Welcome to the club. There is a real enemy, and he really hates you. And he really does want to see you fail. In fact, he'd like to kill you. But I'm here to tell you that there's a love that is greater than life itself. A love that is stronger than any sin you have ever committed, whether you're watching by way of the internet this morning or whether you're seated here in this room, I'm here to tell you, I'm a living example that the love of God is greater than any sin. If you confess your sins one to another, the Bible said, He is faithful to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's what He said. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, people praying. Jesus said this in, in John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, you are whosoever, that whosoever would believe on him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. So today with heads bowed and eyes closed, people praying. If that's you today, you need to make a decision for Christ. Maybe you've never accepted Him before. He's here for you today. Remember the process? Believe in your heart. Confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. You shall be saved. you're in the sound of my voice today if you're watching by way of the internet today on Facebook if you're watching this later 
on YouTube. If you'll just send us a message saying, hey, I accepted Jesus today. We'll do our best to reach out to you. We, 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 we want to see you raised up. If you're in this room this morning, you say, Preacher, I've never accepted Jesus before in my life, but I want to today. Listen, the times that we're living in are scary. They are scary. The Bible says this, in the last days, there will be a great harvest. I think that harvest is upon us. I think our days on this earth are short. That eastern sky, one day, and I believe one day soon, is going to part. Jesus is going to step through. There's going to be the sound of a trumpet. The dead in Christ are going to come up out of the ground. They're going to meet Jesus in the air. Then you and I who are left here will leave this earth and rise and meet him in the air. It's called the rapture of the church. And we are going to the promised land forever and eternity. The only way that you're going to make that trip is by right now saying, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I want to be a Christian. If you're here today and that's your desire, I'm going to ask you if you just slip your hand up. I want to pray with you. Regardless of who you are, where you are, where you come from, or what you've done, if Jesus Christ is knocking on the door, and I know he is, of your heart, if you'll slip your hand up, I want to pray with you. Amen. I want to see, I want, you, I want you to know Jesus is going to be Lord of your life from this day forward. Maybe, maybe you got saved and backslid is what we call it. You walked away from the Lord. You turned your back on all that he had. But today you recognize the time. You say, God, I want to come back to you. Will you have me? His answer is yes. If you're here today and you say, Preacher, I need to rede rededicate, recommit my life to Christ. If that's you, raise your hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Preacher, that's me. I want to recommit my... I see your hand, sir. You can put it down. Yes, ma'am, I see your hand. You can put it down. Listen, it's never too late to do the right thing. Amen? Anybody else? Preacher, that's me. I want to recommit my life to Christ today. I'm not taking any chances whatsoever. One of the hardest things for me as a pastor to be called to do a funeral or a memorial service, and I always ask, well, what's the relationship with the, the deceased, with the Lord. Nothing worse than having them say, well, really don't believe they had any relationship with the Lord. Don't believe they knew the Lord. Wow. Wow. Don't let that be you. Let your... your story be out yeah, he knew the Lord she knew the Lord I have every confidence in the world that they're in the presence of Jesus right now amen if you raised your hand I'm going to ask you to get up and come right now to the front of this church if you raised it get up here you had faith to raise it keep on believing keep on believing come on come on right here come on I need some people a little pray Mike come on 
Come on. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come here, brother. Come here. Come here. Listen. I have prayed with every one of you already. Every one of you. I can't tell you how many times I have come to this altar and said, God, I need to recommit my life to you. So don't ever, don't ever let the devil tell you what well, you've already been up to. You can't go again. What are they going to think? I don't care what anybody thinks. My desire is to make sure he's happy. If I have to get to the altar every Sunday to make sure that I know I'm going to glory, I'm going to be at the altar every Sunday. But I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Say, dear Lord, come into my heart. I repent of all my faults, of all of my sins. Be Lord of my life from this day forward. Be real. Help me to keep on believing that you are my Lord my Savior, my Redeemer, my transport out of this place into your kingdom. I thank you that my name is written down in the Lamb's book of life forever and ever. Amen. Now, devil, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Give them glory. Hallelujah. Now, devil, I serve notice on you right now. These are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus over their mind, soul, spirit, body, will over their very life. God, that you will walk with them. God, that you will guide them, direct them, fill his mind with your thoughts, his ears with your still, small voice, God. Fill his heart with your love and compassion. Lord, I pray your anointed touch on his hands, let out of his belly flow rivers of living water. Father, I thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen, amen. and amen. Only go on believing. Go on believing. Go on believing. Listen, I'm glad you were here today. I will be glad to see you on Wednesday. The ladies are going to get back together on Thursday. The men are going to get back together on Friday. The family of God is going to go and grow because we are going to walk in victory over disease and the demonic. Did you shut me off? I said the family of God is going to walk in victory over disease and the demonic. Amen. Amen. We are going to walk by faith and not by sight. And Father, I pray over this entire congregation, health and wholeness and Holy Ghost boldness, God, to walk according to your word in, a, in the days of darkness that are upon us. Lord, I pray that you would begin whoo, a weeding out. Lord, I pray that you would, would replace people in power that are unrighteous with people of righteousness, people of faith. God, I'm not naming any names. I'm just saying, God, replace the ungodly with godly the unrighteous with righteousness. Lord, and I thank you for it. We give you glory and praise and honor in Jesus' name. And the church said amen and amen. God bless you. God go with you. We'll see you Wednesday night. Amen. God bless. Thank you for watching today. God bless you.